we continue with part two. Okay, so you get back to the United States right. and you you go to Fort Bliss to get treatment for the rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what happens then? When when do you meet Grand Mimi or Mimi or Polly, as well, we all know her? The, is this was in the spring of 46. And I had uh, finished the first year of dental school and it was necessary to go back three more years, of course. And so uh, I spent the summer taking college courses at Southeast Missouri State Teachers College in those years was the proper name. Now it's a university status. And so I joined a music club and we went to the St. Louis Municipal Theater, commonly called the Muni in St. Louis, where they have outdoor musicals. And I rode on the bus, and on this bus was a single girl, of course, a redhead, and uh, I happened to sit by her. And so that was our acquaintance. And so during that summer, I was very well acquainted with her, and then I had to go back to dental school. And then uh, that went on for several years. I would come home in the summertime and meet her, and sometimes on weekends after that. But we finally then uh, married in 48, right at Christmas time. In fact, uh, on Christmas Day of 48, and uh, after that time, uh, it was a happy time for 69 years until she had a massive stroke and passed away. Well, on that wedding day, on December 25th, tell me about the weather conditions. Boy, it was horrible. The best man was to come from up in Illinois. He had been my roommate in dental school, and uh, he was snowbound, and he couldn't make it. And so we used my former orchestra leader as the best man. Uh, and so during this horrible weather in, on Christmas Day, we did the wedding. Fortunately, there's a great boundary in the uh, weather situation, just as there had been of many thousands of years ago when the Gulf of Mexico came up as far as Sykeston, Missouri, which is 35 miles south. So the weather patterns are much better uh, down in that area than they were in Cape Girardeau. And we went to New Orleans for the honeymoon. We drove. It was like an ice storm, right? It um, was a terrible ice storm. Everything was just covered in ice, and was it treacherous even to get to? Where were you married? I married in the First Presbyterian Church of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, Dr. Eric Mount, minister at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, strangely enough, the highways weren't slick, though, so it must have been a sudden storm without a slow freezing of the ground. Were a lot of people in attendance at the wedding? I don't think there were many. <laughs> I can't remember too many people there, um, but it went off just fine without a hitch, even though the best man did, wasn't able to make it. But uh, it was surely nice of my orchestra leader to fill in for him. That was good. Um, did you always know you wanted kids? Oh yes, we always, I, I think we'd agree, agree to that. Had four children, three girls and a son. Mm -hmm. and now have six grandchildren and eight uh, great-grandchildren. Incredible. It's been a good family. <laughs> Everyone in the family has been very cooperative and has, they've been particularly nice to me since my wife passed away too. Yeah, that was hard to say goodbye to Grand Mimi or at least so long for now until uh -huh. we see her again. What was the hardest part about raising kids? Oh, I don't think there was anything difficult about it. Mm -hmm. I can't remember any obstacles. Uh, we took three daughters to uh, North Africa 
before the son was born, and I guess that was the hardest, but it was for my wife. It wasn't hard for me, because I was already in Libya at the time, in okay. 1952. So back up and tell me about that. So you're, you're married, and you're living happily, you're, having, you're starting to have babies, uh -huh. and then do you get deployed again, or what happens? Well, I was, I was uh, on a certificate of disability, mm -hmm. so it wasn't compulsory to go back. I was on the reserves, mm -hmm. and uh, they were shark dentists, and the Korean conflict came up. I never saw Korea, because first of all, they needed a dentist in Germany, and so down near Munich, or München, I uh, was at the former Luftwaffe. Uh, jet propulsion base, and this was an experimental base where they never really had jets, but where they had, had made the attempt at it, called Erding was the name of the town. And I was there at a time when they had 16 feet accumulation of snow. Now it was down in Bavaria, so it was easy for me to get to go to Garmisch Partenkirchen where later on my wife went with me to that winter resort and to see the Oberammer Gal Passion play. And so it was interesting. And we did find, or I did find at the time, and then we tried to get the family over and they said, no, no housing on base. Uh, you have to live on the economy. And so I finally made arrangements, and I was ready to bring my wife and three daughters over to Germany when they said, well, we need a dentist in Tripoli. And I thought, boy, that's fun. We get to go to the Holy Land tours and live right there by it. Uh, not so easy right now, but at that time it was fine. Would have been fine, except that the Tripoli turned out to be Tripoli, Libya, and not Lebanon. Now, the town gets its name from three ancient Roman Phoenician cities, where the traders came across the lower section of the Mediterranean to reach those cities. There were many other civilizations, too numerous for me to mention, in ancient history that involved those cities. But where the present city of Tripoli, Libya, is located, it was called Oea, O-E-A, in Roman Phoenician times. And to the uh, west was the city of Sabratha, which is known for its renowned ancient theater. The, all these ancient buildings were at one time covered with marble, but they've been stripped down and used for other building projects. Then the town to the east, towards Egypt from Libya, from Tripoli, Libya, or Oya, was Leptis Magna. And this is a larger city, and it was the home of one of the former Roman emperors, Septimius Severus, mm -hmm. who was fortunately born there and did well with with the city and promoting its, its establishment. How long were you in Germany separated from Polly and the three girls? About two months, I would think. So you were over there two months in 16 feet of snow in Germany mm -hmm. and thought, okay, I'm gonna bring them over. And then that's when they said, you're going to Tripoli. Oh no, by the way, it's Tripoli, Libya. Uh, mm -hmm. And so then you, do you meet Polly and the girls there? Do they come over by themselves? Yes, uh, they couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't travel with them because I was already down in Tripoli working and I had to wait until an apartment building could be built in town uh, in the Arab population area of Tripoli. In fact, the first night that they were there, there was a parade from a mosque down the street with all sorts of interesting Arab music going on. And uh, it was quite unique. I think she was really shocked that first night. But we had to wait till the sandstone blocks were sawed out. They were soft when they were first mined. 
and then they had to be built, and then they dried out. And until she could get there, after I had the proper authority and the location, they molded. And so everything was a moldy mess in the apartment because of the moisture from these sandstone blocks. Unbelievable. So she comes across the world, basically, with these three young girls who are like, are they toddlers? They're one, two, and three. They were one, two, and three years old. My dad, Denise, and Danielle. Were one, two, and three years old. I mean, that is a huge amount, especially back in that time. People weren't just flying to Africa, right? Well, these were not Air Force. I mean, these were not commercial airplanes. These were military airplanes with bucket seats. And fortunately, most military servicemen on the flights were very helpful with my wife. So she had a problem, but I didn't have any of those problems. I was already there. <laughs> Still, you had to see them through the time there. How long were you there? Uh, two years. You were there for two that years? That is, the period of, of service time was two years from 52 to 54. We now have annual uh, uh, um, get-togethers. Yeah, reunions, right? You reunions with the Tripoli, Libya people. We call it the Wheelers Force, Wheelers Air Force group. And we meet each year at some military location that has interesting museums. And uh, last year was Tucson. And we'll, we'll be going, and I'll take one daughter and her spouse each year as a guest because they were dependents mm -hmm. at that age. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, operated by a girl who was in high school age when she mm -hmm. lived as a dependent mm -hmm. in Libya. So about how many people attend those reunions? There are about 27 servicemen and up to 150 total with everybody uh, that are dependents. Oh, okay, so you spend the two years there in Tripoli, mm -hmm. what do you think was the highlight of that time? Or what? how would you characterize that time? Well, I think flying with the chaplain to remote radar bases mm -hmm. along the Mediterranean, because this was radar uh, espionage, you might call it, on Russia. And it was important to know when certain planes were flying and where we were needed with our backup strategic air command. And so Wheelis was an important base. And I would go out and play the pump organ for the chaplain at these bases. And then the sand from the Ghiblis, G-H-I-B-L-I, -I, is a sandstorm that comes up from the south. Mm -hmm. And was blowing sand and would get into the vacuum parts of the pump organ. So I would bring it to the dental clinic where we would use compressed air and blow the sand out. Mm -hmm. So it was, I say that was a most unique experience. However, taking the family to the three Roman ruins uh, was certainly impressive. And Dana, who was three, remarked at one place where they were would offer a camel ride. She says, I don't want to ride that that camel because the flies would bite my bottom. <laughs> and Denise uh, would, uh, the middle daughter at age two, would find the song, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window, her, her feature, and the orchestra would play that for her and she would do a little squatting dance in the officer's club. That's great, those are neat memories. And so then you, go back home to Cape Girardeau after two years, or what happened then? Yes, but uh, another interesting thing came up. The base was expanding tremendously. When I got there, we only had a two-chair dental office. Well, we tried to improve that by using uh, night shift work mm -hmm. in a dental clinic. And we did the best we could until a new dental clinic opening with six units but there was nobody to put in the equipment, but we had the equipment. It was good SS White dental units with no 
installation man. And so I installed all the units. I guess that would be the second interesting feature, and they all worked. When you were there, did you attend church? I did. I played for all the Protestant services, which were held at night. The Catholic services used the theater and were held in the morning. And I'll tell you, we were better off because the theater had a disappointing feature to it. It had sand fleas. And for going to theaters and to Catholic church mass, it was a problem. But anyway, we did not have that in the chapel where I regularly played. Unbelievable. So faith has always been part of your life, right? Well, oh, yeah. What do you, th has that helped kind of given you strength over the years or kept you going or kept you grounded or how well, it, it can make you feel better when you don't feel well i'll tell you that and i experienced that as i've already mentioned but uh, i think uh, music and therapy uh, are two great things and shouldn't be overlooked mm -hmm. and should be done equally with medicine prescribed mm -hmm. were your parents presbyterian Yes, Presbyterian mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. And my mother be, had been Lutheran, and uh, we she had uh, five in her family, and her mother had said, well, at the Lutheran school where you should be going, they're teaching German uh, in all the classes, and she says, I don't care to have my, my daughter working in German, of course the war was on then, so, mm -hmm. well, it was before the war, but at least later on it would have been. <laughs> so it wasn't very popular to be doing that. And she said, I'm gonna send my daughter to a Presbyterian school, but well, to public schools, which used the Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. And the church, the school bell was the Presbyterian church bell. So at what point do you head back to the United States? Oh. Head back to the United States in 54, and 10 years later that we missed, Gaddafi could be seen running through the town on a camel caravan, shooting up the place, and getting ready to take over from King Idris el Sanusi. Now the interesting thing was they were both of the clan Sanusi, S-E-N-U-S-I. And neither one liked to live in Tripoli, Libya, where it was quite warm. But they both liked to live in the highlands of Benghazi. And of course, Benghazi has recently figured in the news as a loss, a great loss of some of our uh, personnel. Uh, interesting thing about Benghazi, it's on a high level. It's where the city of Cyrene had been located biblically. And it hasn't been mentioned very much, but the Gulf of Cyrene is filled with seaweed. And so if Hillary Clinton had any uh, observation of this and whether the Navy failed to do any activities because of the Gulf of Seaweed, it might have been a wonderful excuse for them in the uh, uh, publicity that followed that loss of our ambassador. Now, when you came back from Tripoli, and is that the time that you get involved with Rotary? Because your travels beyond the, the Tripoli, the Philippines and Tripoli experience in Germany were mainly due to your volunteer work with the Rotary, correct? Yes. The first mission trip was to Guatemala. And it was because other people of our community had done so, had gone down and they were really impressed with Guatemala. Plus the fact that the Bishop of Southern Illinois, Bishop Zero West, Z-U-R-O-W-E-S-T-E, -E, had a brother-in-law who was a dentist who had surveyed the needs of Central America for the Catholic Church. And he came up with the need for a clinic in El Progreso, uh, 
Cabecera, which is the common name, El Progreso Progress is every place, of course, but it was for the uh, community, Catholic community in this little town near, near the Honduran border. And so um, it was uh, the location that we were to go because it had a building for a dental clinic. They didn't have much equipment and we carried what was available from the Missouri Dental Association, portable equipment, and we carried supplies with us. And we did some fairly good restorative work, I feel, not just surgical work. Most of the mission trips are surgical work, but this, this also accomplished some uh, restorative work, means fillings, but we didn't do any prosthetic work, which would have been more complicated and needed a laboratory. And so we went to this community area, but there were several other stations associated with it. I remember going to, in the care of some nuns as our host, uh, in a, where we worked in a social security building that the women in our group and the kids were teenage, the girls were teenagers then. So my wife and the teenage girls could stay in the convent at night, but my son and I had to stay in our camper outside the wall. And the nuns came out the next morning and said, well, the frogs got another one of our chickens. These were giant frogs in Guatemala that were eating the baby chickens. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So these nuns were our hosts and they fed us and took care of us and we moved on to another community where uh, a priest, uh, Mance, his, his quarters were used as a dental office and a strange thing took place in here. We had compressed air and restorative equipment but we kept the air compressor outside the room because they're very noisy. And then we had this long black hose leading into the room and it came loose from the equipment. And if you've ever heard of how a fireman's peril where his hose gets loose from him and starts whipping around, well, that's the way our air compressor did. In the meantime, we had five or six patients already anesthetized and ready for the, having restorative work seated around the room. And you can imagine a pandemonium with this hose jumping around in the, the priest's living quarters. Oh, well, we've had some interesting experiences, I'll tell you. But you took times. all the, the whole family there too, to Guatemala. Oh yeah, they were there. And how many, how many months or weeks were you there? Oh, most of those trips are a month long, a month. but this uh, first trip was just a couple weeks. It was about three weeks, I think. Okay, would it have been over the summer vacation or something for the kids who were in school? I guess so, I can't remember yeah. precisely, but I, I think so, because we, we worked outside. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Guatemala, you can do that mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. all year long. Do you think that the time you had spent abroad uniquely prepared you to do this kind of mission work? Oh, absolutely, and it did the children uh, because uh, I let the children do simple extractions, which in the United States would have been illegal, but there's no malpractice suits possible in foreign countries. At least there wasn't at that time. I don't know how it is now because I've been retired for 12 years or so. Well, and that planted a seed because so, so many of the kids ended up in the dental field. Everybody. All of them. Uh, so all the children were either dental hygienists or dentists. And um, to this day, uh, several are still working, although uh, one is retired. Well, maybe that first extraction in Guatemala yeah. inspired them. <laughs> well, I think so. I think it was a, a good work for them. Yeah. And it was pleasant. Mm -hmm. We had a nice time. Every place we went, people are always worried nowadays, well, 
how around the world did you travel and camp? But there were not campgrounds in those days, so we camped by the side of the road. Except for Mexico City, I remember stopping at uh, one campground in Mexico City. It's the only one I had heard of at that time. Wow. Okay. But it was interesting. Hold on, I'm going to stop this now.